Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, the best science fiction and fantasy erotica podcast in the known universe. This week's story, part two of last month's command performance story, Sauce for the Gander. This is episode 440. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by the generous patronage of Nobilis Erotica listeners. To help out paying the authors and voices that create these stories, visit patreon.com slash nobilis. I'm proud to present Sauce for the Gander Part 2, narrated by Vivienne Ferrari. The first part was posted a couple weeks ago. Go back to 439 if you haven't already listened. Let's not waste any time. Here we go. Sauce for the Gander, Part 2, written by Nubilis Reed, read by Vivian Ferrari. The next morning, when Derek checked the monitors looking into the hold, he found that Erebus was alert and active, moving about in his lair. Elsie leaned down behind him and whispered, Looks like it's time. Derek's heart suddenly gave a tremendous thud, and he swallowed hard. Yeah. Come on, let's get you ready. She led him down to the hatch leading to the cargo bay. You seem a lot more enthusiastic about this than you were yesterday, he said. I decided that the only way you were going to understand was for you to experience it yourself. Better for both of us in the long run. Doubt surfaced in Derek's mind. It had been there all along, submerged, but now he found himself confronting it. The thought that her session with the monster had changed Elsie somehow. They were telepathic, some said. They could alter your mind, turn you into their slave. If that was true, what would this do to him? Elsie must have seen the conflict. She turned him around and kissed him deeply. It's going to be great, you'll see. There was no going back now. He had asked Elsie for this, and if he changed his mind now, he was going to look like a fool. Furthermore, someone needed to go in there. And what would happen if Elsie had a second helping of whatever it was the monster was offering them? No, it was better if both of them experienced whatever it was, and if they were changed by it, well, any experience changes a person, right? Derek squared his shoulders. I'm ready. Oh, no, you're not, said Elsie with a wink. She held up a tube of personal lubricant. Do you want to do the honors, or shall I give you a hand? Just a finger or two should be enough, Derek quipped. <laughs> Strip down and bend over, comedian. Derek stripped out of his jumpsuit and flimsies and bent forward, hands on his knees, while Elsie squirted some of the tube's contents onto her fingers. As she massaged the gel around and into his butthole, Derek's heart beat a little quicker, a little harder. He had never had the occasion to think about what it might be like to fuck a tentacle monster. He had never had reason to. But now, all that he could think about was the beatific look on Elsie's face as she had come out of the hold. Elsie slapped him on the butt. Go get him, tiger. Derek nodded, took a deep breath, and opened the hatch. The hold was dimly lit, just like before, and a bit warmer than the rest of the ship. The wombar's single huge eye turned in his direction, its glowing iris sparkling in the darkness. It's me, he said. Derek, I hope it's okay that I came to you instead of my partner. You didn't really say who you wanted, so... The end of the creature's tail rose up and flicked an unmistakable come-closer gesture. Derek walked closer. The wombar raised up until its huge eye was level with Derek's face. Up close, there was even more to see. Subtle shifts of color, sparks that ran in and out along the radiating structures from the pupil, dancing motes of light that seemed to somehow imply limitless depths to the black center of the orb. While he stared into those depths, the monster wrapped its coils around his body and gently guided him down onto the padded floor of its lair. His arms were held tightly to his sides, and his thighs were pressed together by the thick coils of the wombar's body. The surface wasn't like human skin at all. 
It was more like satin, slippery without being wet or slimy, and it slid over his skin without any resistance. There was definitely something going on between him and the monster, some influence at work. A strange feeling came over him, a kind of frozen excitement. His thoughts were his own, but he couldn't move his limbs or look away from the dazzling eye in front of his face. His body wasn't paralyzed or rigid. He simply couldn't muster the will to actually tell his body to do anything. He could have kicked his feet, his legs were free below the knee, but the impulse just faded before it actually caused any motion. The strange paralysis had no effect on his libido, however. Under the coils, Derek's cock was getting harder, twitching and swelling with each beat of his accelerating heart. The monster rolled him onto his back and loosened its coils just enough for the tip of its tail to slide in behind his knees and the gap just above them. Derek had never thought of his knees as an erogenous zone, but that ended quick. As the monster's flesh slid up his thighs and under his cock, he couldn't help the thought that this was a preview of what was to come. The monster wasn't going to fuck his ass. It was going to fuck a third of his body, from his lower thighs on up. It moved slowly, without pause, gliding along his skin without any resistance. It seemed to expend no effort at all in spite of the tight confines between his limbs and the monster's body. It poked around a bit when it encountered his balls, causing him to become even more erect, then found the space under his perineum and between the cheeks of his ass. The anticipation of this long, slow exploration only heightened Derek's arousal. His heart thundered, his breathing came deep and shuddering, and there were tingles in his hands and feet. He wanted to say, yes, please. He wanted to tell it to hurry up. He couldn't wait any longer, but the words died before even reaching his throat. He couldn't even move his eyes from the creature's iridescent gaze. Even more slowly, the tail tip found his butthole and pushed. The pressure was inexorable, and Derek found that he did have enough volition to relax and allow it to penetrate him. He was immediately grateful for Elsie's preparation, as it went in easily. For a moment, it paused, neither thrusting nor withdrawing, as if allowing Derek to become accustomed to its presence. There was, however, the slightest pulse to it, as if it were becoming slightly larger and smaller. Or was that his own heartbeat? He couldn't tell. He had never been penetrated like this before, never had anything but the occasional finger up his butt. This was an entirely new experience. Then it started moving. How long had it been? Derek could no longer say. He had lost connection with time, lost the ability to even count his heartbeats. There was nothing but sensation. The firm grip of the monster's body around his, the feeling of its tail snaking up between his legs, and the firm yet gentle thrusts as it fucked him. The thrusts started shallow, gradually going deeper, but never fast or hard, and that was just fine with Derek. He found the slow rhythm almost soothing, even as it drove him to even higher levels of arousal. His cock throbbed, pressed against his leg until the monster shifted its coils. Then it was caught between two loops of the monster's body, squeezed with the same satiny firmness as the rest of him. He never wanted this to end, but the monster seemed to have no concept of edging, of backing off when he was close to orgasm. It stimulated him unrelentingly, the thrusts of its tail into his ass causing his cock to slide between its coils. Too soon, too soon, Derek's body clenched and spasmed in the throes of orgasm. It was a little weird, coming with his eyes open and staring, but the pleasure was too intense for that added little bit of strangeness to make any difference at all. The monster didn't react to his orgasm at all. It kept thrusting, squeezing, increasing speed by almost imperceptible degrees, it must have been for quite some time, because Derek became hard again and orgasmed a second time before it slid out of his butt and released him from its grip. Elsie was there, helping him to his feet and into the shower where she cleaned him off and wrapped him in a warm towel. Wow, was all he could say. Right, she replied. 
Words can't express it. He looked into her eyes and kissed her. Thank you. It was a supreme effort to be able to assemble that much coherence. Come on, let's get you into bed. I'm not sleepy. Yeah, but you're going to need some time to recover. Derek allowed himself to be led into the stateroom. He sat on the bed but didn't lie down. Elsie sat next to him. As his thoughts gradually returned to him, he began taking an internal inventory. Had anything changed? Had the monster affected him somehow? Sitting and contemplating, it was hard to tell. He turned to Elsie, started to say something, stopped. I know, she said with a nod. He found words. What do we do now? He asked. Elsie got up and went to Derek's storage compartment and took out his violin. Here. Derek lifted the lid of the case and took out the instrument and his bow. He tuned it up and played. He started with a simple etude, moved on to a few other practice pieces. His hands knew the music, his ears knew the music, and his brain knew better than to get in the way. Elsie sat down next to him again and listened. After fifteen minutes, he felt more like himself again. He took the violin from his shoulder and said, Thank you. This is what I needed. Tentacle monsters aren't big on aftercare, said Elsie. Elsie and Derek had never been big on BDSM. They had played around with it a little, and it had been fun, but going in deep had seemed like a lot of trouble for little result, so the blindfold and flogger mostly stayed in the bottom of the sex toy compartment. Still, they knew the basics, and she was right. What Derek had needed most was aftercare, and he felt a lot better for having it. Thank you, he said, and leaned over and kissed her. After a while, Derek dressed and returned to the cockpit. Elsie sat down with her crochet while he checked on their status. He frowned and sent the status over to her station. She straightened up to look it over and shared the frown. Does that say what it looks like it says? Yep, we're going to reach New Tribeca in six hours. More than a day ahead of schedule. Yep. Does that happen? Ships going faster than they were supposed to? No, not to my knowledge. Sometimes you go slower if there's a supernova or something that disrupts the hyperspace geometry, but our path doesn't go anywhere near anything like that. Don't we have sensors or something that tells us about that kind of thing? Well, yes, in case we need to drop out for some reason. Derek punched up a new screen. He hadn't looked at it in ages, not since his qualification for his navigator's license. All that stuff was handled automatically. Huh. He gestured at the numbers on the hollow screen, instructing the computer to arrange them into a diagram. Hyperspace is just... smoother. The usual bumps and gradients just aren't there. Is there anything to worry about? Nope. Well, except that it's going to mean that there won't be any need for a third session with the Wombar. Elsie sighed, then shrugged. You don't seem as disappointed as I expected, said Derek. Oh, it was an amazing experience, she replied. But when I was taking care of you, I realized that sex can be about more than just an amazing experience. She set the crochet aside to reach out and take his hand. And I'd rather have a slightly less amazing experience with someone who cares about me. We're still going to get the rope, though, said Derek. I mean... Elsie laughed. <laughs> yes, we're still going to get the rope. When Derek headed back to the cargo area to check on the monster, he found the wombar already packing up its crash. Looks like you already know we'll be arriving at New Tribeca soon, he said. The monster turned back and bobbed its eye at him, something like a nod. Is there anything else you need? It bobbed side to side, then went back to its work, deftly rolling the floor covering into one of the boxes with its tail. Derek had to admit, he felt some disappointment. 
Even though he wouldn't be enjoying the Wombar's company on the now aborted third session, he had been feeling some anticipation of the vicarious enjoyment of watching Elsie. As he returned to the cockpit, he said, Erebus is already packing up. Derek lightly bit his cheek thoughtfully. Well, that's convenient, said Elsie. How did he know? Hmm? How did the monster know we were coming out of hyperspace ahead of schedule? I think it knew. I think the monster is somehow behind this phenomenon. Derek waved his hand at the display that still showed the bizarrely uniform shape of hyperspace around them. Well, it's not a mystery we are going to solve. That's probably true. Derek leaned down and kissed her. Should we tell anyone? I'm not sure there's a simple way to take advantage of this. We'd need to add a tentacle monster to the crew, and Erebus seems intent on disembarking at New Tribeca. Besides, Elsie took his hand and squeezed. A tentacle monster is fun, but it's you I love. Seven hours later, the A.H. Lee settled on the landing pad at the little colony on New Tribeca, and Erebus and its cargo were offloaded. Derek and Elsie would have stayed to look over the new colony, but there was another ship waiting to use the landing pad, and there was a well-paid contract on the colony's board to deliver a package to New New Boston. So they lifted off again almost immediately. Once they were back in hyperspace, Elsie came into the cockpit and laid her hand on Derek's shoulder. I've got something to show you, she said. Hmm? He rose and followed her back to their quarters, where he discovered, lying coiled in the middle of their bed, several lengths of thick rope. As soon as we were out of hyperspace, I called ahead. Turns out, someone on New Tribeca has a really good synthesizer. Derek wrapped her in his arms and kissed her. I'll tie you up first if you promise to do the same for me after. Deal. While Elsie stripped out of her coverall, Derek had the computer search for tentacle-inspired rope bondage for the beginner. Most of the instructions and demonstrations did not look like they were designed for beginners, but he found one that seemed pretty simple. The rope was thick, flexible, and had a smooth, soft surface over a firm core, colored a bright purplish pink. Derek took the longest piece from the pile and found the middle just as Elsie finished getting undressed and presented herself. Okay, if anything feels like it's too tight or cutting off circulation, let me know, he said, echoing instructions that had come with the diagram. Elsie's face looked a little flushed. Will do. Derek started by wrapping the center of the rope around her back, over her upper arms, and over the top of her breasts, where he looped the two ends over each other, and then returned to her back, under her breasts. He arranged the thick strands in parallel rows down her body, binding her upper arms tight to her body, and making them squeeze her breasts together beautifully. He tied off the rope with a huge bow right over her navel. I can still move a little, she said, bending her arms at the elbow. Not done yet, said Derek. He gave her breasts a double squeeze and then reached for another length of rope. With this one, he tied each wrist to her upper thigh, wrapping the thick cord around several times to spread the pressure out. Better? he asked. Elsie just purred in response. It's not the same, but it's good. She squirmed a little, not really struggling, and the top rope seemed like it was going to ride up to her neck and come loose, which would undo the whole affair. Hold on, said Derek. He took the last piece of rope and looped it around the one that was coming free and brought the ends down and around to tie off on the lengths holding her wrists in place, which stabilized things nicely. The flush in Elsie's face was spreading down her neck. Derek plucked at her nipples with his fingers and leaned in to kiss her again. Anything pinching or too tight? Nope. It's lovely. Good. He spun her around and pushed her onto the bed, evoking a whoop of surprise when she toppled onto her back. Derek climbed up after her, straddling her thighs and surveying his handiwork. Not too bad for a first-timer, he said. 
He checked the ropes, tugging on them here and there to make sure they weren't too tight, and then pinched Elsie's nipples, lifting and shaking them so that her breasts wobbled between the ropes. How's this working for you? Shut up and fuck me, she replied, with more than a little growl in her voice. Derek's first instinct was to do as he was told, but then a wicked grin came to his face. I think you're a little confused about who's the one tied up here, he said. He reached down to give her pussy a caress, and then a light slap right on her labia. Elsie winced. Ow, fuck! No, listen, I don't want pain, I don't want humiliation, I just want you to tie me up and fuck me, okay? Okay, okay. It's just that your body is so delectable like this. I couldn't help playing with it. Derek rubbed her labia gently, with one finger slipping between to touch her more sensitive folds. Elsie bucked against the touch, rubbing herself against his fingers. Her flesh was slick, and his fingers glided effortlessly over her sex. Wow, this all has you pretty rocked up, doesn't it? I'm going to rock you up if you don't stop teasing and fuck me. Chuckling, Derek repositioned her legs and touched the tip of his erection to her entrance, slicking it with her fluids. Teasing, Elsie shouted. All right, all right, but only because you asked so nicely, Derek said, and sank himself up to the hilt. He found it easy to get dominant when she was tied up like this, which had surprised him. He supposed he should get used to learning new things about himself, now that their sex life was poised on the edge of a new phase. Elsie groaned and arched her back, then planted her feet and pushed back against him. Harder, she growled. Derek obliged, thrusting hard but slow, and making sure he ground his pubic bone against hers with each deep thrust. He would have liked to have gone faster, but he wanted to make this good for her. His signal to shift into hyperdrive and really go at it was when she stopped pushing back against him, too caught up in her own pleasure to coordinate her movements. He shifted his position and increased his pace, thrusting hard and fast, as Elsie moaned and spasmed with the beginning of a prodigious orgasm. He followed seconds later, groaning as her body clenched around him. Derek lay down beside her, limp and panting. Good? Good. After a few seconds to catch his breath, Derek pulled out the knots and released Elsie from the ropes. My turn? Sure, but let's clean up a little first. She climbed out of the bed and into their washroom, which had a shower cubicle big enough for both of them. After a few minutes of rinsing off, some of which involved kisses and gropes, they dried off and headed back to the bedroom. All right, stand with your arms behind your back, said Elsie. Derek clasped his hands behind his back, and she wrapped the rope around his chest, then around his arms and back around the front again, securing his elbows and wrists in place and forcing his shoulders back. The tie was firm, but not painful, though he was pretty sure it would put some stress on his joints if he were to lie on his back. With two more ropes, she wrapped several loops around his thighs with some length left over. Then she had him crawl onto the bed on his knees and bend over with his butt in the air. Once he was in the position she wanted, she tied the extra length from the ties around his legs to one of the ropes around his belly, forcing him to stay in that kneeling position. Derek shuddered with anticipation, hair standing up all over his body. From his position, he couldn't see Elsie very well, but he could hear as she opened one of the storage compartments. I hope you like this, she said, because just thinking about it has me oozing down my leg. The bed shifted as she climbed up behind him, and he felt a cool touch between his butt cheeks as Elsie spread lube all around his asshole. A moment later, something smooth and hard touched it, then applied a bit of pressure. Is that a strap-on? Derek asked. Better than that. A little more pressure. Derek relaxed and the tip of whatever it was slipped inside. Better? 
Elsie eased forward very slowly until he felt her thighs against his butt. It's got a bulb that goes inside me and neural stimulators. So it feels, oh, it feels like it's part of me. Derek wanted to turn around and look at this device his partner had procured, but his bindings prevented it. The object felt different than the wombar's tentacle tail, less flexible but not as thick, and it didn't go as deep inside him. That was fine. It felt just as good, and from the sounds Elsie was making, she was enjoying it as well. Soon he was groaning just as loud as she was. Treacherous man, Elsie growled in between moans of pleasure. <laughs> what? You started this while... While you were still recovering, refractory. Derek's erection was indeed only just now beginning to return. I hadn't planned it that way, but mm, I'm not going to say I regret it. I should get my revenge by dialing down the sensitivity and, oh, banging the hell out of you. But you're not, Derek replied. Feels too good. Derek was trembling a bit now, cock throbbingly hard, face plowed into the covers by Elsie's hard thrusts. It was a different feeling than when he was fucking her, a more diffuse feeling, like his whole body was ready to come rather than just his cock. It grew stronger, robbing him of speech, robbing him of thought. If he hadn't been tied up, he would have collapsed onto the bed. Instead, he just let the bindings do their job, holding him in place, so he could just feel. And the best part was Elsie. She wasn't just some monster that needed a body to fuck. She was his partner, and she was doing this for him because she loved him, and that made all the difference. He had given himself to her, and she to him, and that made letting go so much easier. They didn't need hypnosis or telepathy or whatever it was the monster used. Derek came, hard, growling, spraying the covers beneath him with his spunk, clenching around the shaft in his ass. Elsie gave one, maybe two strokes while his vision whited out and cried out in ecstasy as well, holding his hips with her artificial dick plunged as far into him as it would go. After a few seconds to catch her breath, she reached down and untied the bows holding his thighs to his belly, and Derek rolled onto his side, falling limp. Elsie quickly undid the rest of the bindings and lay down next to him, careful to avoid the wet spot. Good? she asked. Amazing, he replied. He could still feel little twitches in his butt muscles as his body readjusted. Good for you too, I think. Oh, yeah. She stroked the artificial cock, still hard, and shuddered. I think I'm going to get a lot of use out of this thing. And that's our story. I recently sat for an interview with Leela Sinha, host of the Power Pivot podcast. Brand new thing. And that episode has just gone live. If you're interested in my thoughts on power, community, and compersion, you can find that interview at powerpivot.podigy.io. The link to that will be in the show notes, but if you search your favorite podcast directory for Power Pivot, you'll find it. This month, we're welcoming Lynn as a new patron. In addition to my abiding gratitude... Supporters are currently receiving episodes of an unexpurgated, unauthorized version of a planetary romance from the beginning of the 20th century. To find out what I'm talking about, join us at patreon.com slash nobilis. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica podcast. The music is composed and performed by Mass Relay. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard. <laughs>